Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So first of all, I wanted to note that my hair looks really different. My stylist went a little blonder than uh, I'm typically used to, but I, I don't know, I'm getting used to it. I don't know, what do you guys think? Does it look good? Should I just chop it all off and start over? Let me know. There's no bunny on the bed today, but I do have a cat and I have a dog. If you guys didn't know, I have, well right now I have like 15 animals in the house. So it really varies of who's in the background. There were a lot of comments about my rabbit last time. So today I am doing a video that I've wanted to do for a really long time. This is one of the weirdest stories, one of the most confusing and frustrating cases out there, I think. This is so weird. I can't wait to hear what you guys think of this one, what your opinions are gonna be, and what you think really happened because I cannot come to a conclusion on this one. I have been debating it back and forth with Josh over the past 24 hours. It is just such a frustrating and confusing one. Today I'm gonna to be telling you about a woman named Diane Schuler. So Diane Schuler was born on November 13th, 1972 in Floral Park, New York. She had four brothers and when she was younger, her mom actually left the family. And this was very hard on her, although she did not let this become a big part of her life. She really didn't talk about it often. She did not let it drag her down in any way. And her siblings actually ended up kind of reuniting with their mother, but she never really got that relationship back with her. She just did not want to be involved with her, even though that was so painful. She really glazed over it in her life. May not have dealt with that baggage, actually. Maybe it was a painful thing for her that really could have been eating away at her. She was a very tough lady, and she was considered the woman of her house. She was a very hands-on mother. She really kind of set the rules. She was the boss of the house, according to her husband and the kids and pretty much everyone else that she knew. She was a mother of two. She was married to a man named Daniel Schuler. She had a daughter named Erin and a son named Brian and she loved being a mom. She knew she wanted to be a mom from a young age and she was really into it. Like I said, she was very hands-on. She was involved in the PTA. She was always signing up for things. People that were around her, you know, just describe her as someone who was on top of everything. You know, was very well planned, very organized. Her kids were meticulous. They were definitely known to be well taken care of. She was very into being a mom and that's important for this story. So the day of the incident, July 26, 2009, Diane and her husband Daniel decided to take their kids and their nieces on a camping trip to Hunter Lake Campground in Parksville, New York. And this is a really beautiful area, a great place for families to go to get away from it all and kind of connect. And with them, they had their daughter Erin, their son Brian, and then Diane's nieces, and this is Diane's brother's kids. Kate Hance, who was five years old, Allison, who was seven years old, and Emma, who was eight years old. And it was a very typical morning for camping. They had just had a great couple of days outside, bonding, having fun together, doing some mores, doing all of that. And this was the day that they were going to be driving home. And it was a pretty normal day. Daniel woke up first and started making coffee, started kind of getting things together, and then quickly woke up his wife, Diane, around 7, 7.30ish. They then woke up the kids and started cleaning the camper and they had planned to get on the road as soon as possible to beat the traffic. So they decided that her husband was going to take their dog because he had a truck with an open truck bed. Um, he was gonna take the dog and just go straight home and then she was gonna go straight home as well, but with all the kids. And so she had a minivan. Specifically, she had a red 2003 Ford Windstar minivan that she was actually borrowing from her brother for the weekend. So Diane and the kids headed off at 9.30 a.m. around there to actually get some breakfast at McDonald's. They were on their way back to West Babylon and they stopped at the McDonald's in Liberty on the way. And they even said that she seemed completely normal. She's having a fully attentive conversation with the restaurant worker. Then she drove to a gas station and there's again some video footage, surveillance footage of her at the gas station and she's completely normal in the gas station. She's there to buy some type of pain medication and they ended up not having it so she left without it but they think that she possibly could have been having a painful tooth. So she left the gas station in Liberty just after 11 a.m. and then was driving along Interstate 86 and Interstate 87 and this is when they started getting reports from witnesses that there was a 
person driving a minivan and driving really aggressively, flashing their lights, tailgating, switching back and forth lanes really fast. And then at 11.37, Diane ended up calling her brother. His name is Warren and he is the father of the three girls that were also in the car. And she just told him that they were going to be a little late. They were a bit delayed by traffic. Then around 11.45 a.m., Diane was seen by a witness on the side of the road and it looked like she might have been throwing up. She seemed to kind of have her head bent over and was leaning down, looked like she was sick. And then a little while after that, at a kind of rest stop area, she was seen doing the exact same thing. Although no one bothered to go up and see if she was okay or what was going on because they probably would have seen that she had a bunch of kids in the car and maybe she shouldn't have been driving. So then at about 1 p.m., Warren got another call from Diane's phone, but this time it was one of his daughters. Mommy, something's wrong with Aunt Diane. Mommy, something's wrong with Aunt Diane. And she was crying. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. I said, what, what do you mean? And, and I could hear um, Allison crying in the background. I said, let me talk to Aunt Diane. And so Diane got on the phone and well, she just kept saying they're playing, they're having fun. She just didn't sound right. Diane didn't. No. She wasn't making any sense. So no one knows exactly what was going on in that car, but whatever was going on really scared the kids. At the end of the phone call, it just kind of suddenly ended, like she just hung up or got disconnected maybe. And then she left her cell phone on the side of the highway and no one knows why. At 1.15, Warren tried to call back several times, but got no answer. I'm trying to help a friend of mine. Uh, his sister took his go his girls camping. They, they're very young girls. The oldest is nine. The, curl the girls just called in distress. They said that the, the aunt is driving very erratically. We think she's sick. The aunt isn't picking up the cell phone right now. The sister called. She can't talk anymore. There's three kids in the car. They're trying to, five, they're trying to locate her. The woman's name is Diane Shula. We just put it out to the post car okay. and see if they could locate her because the, the the woman that's driving the car they think is having a medical emergency because she, she called and then she couldn't talk anymore and she's got five kids in the car. Uh, Whose name the car is registered to? Warren here. It's, it's my car. It's your car. Yeah. And then at 1.30 p.m., two drivers called 911 to report Diane actually driving really close to the edge of the road going northbound. This is when she came up to an exit ramp. And there were two signs at the end of this exit ramp that said one way and another one that said do not enter. So it should have been very clear to her that she was going the wrong way. But for whatever reason, Diane continued onto the highway going the opposite direction of traffic. And within a minute, there were four different calls placed to 911 reporting someone was driving the wrong way on the highway. They believe you got the northbound Taconic. There's a city van in the right lane going southbound. 911. Hi, I'm on the Taconic Expressway. We just passed uh, 100, exit 100 feet. There's a car going like 70 miles an hour the wrong direction. State Police 911. Yeah, you got a guy driving south on the northbound Taconic Parkway. Ooh, my on. I was in the left lane. Uh, just class president for road. He's going like a bat out of hell. He should be already on the same parkway right now. It was very surreal seeing it coming at you. So what you had to do was, you know, thank God there was nobody on the side. I was able to go over a couple of lanes as the van came by me. And I said at the time 70 miles an hour because it was speeding right by. Dead pin straight. That like pin straight. Wasn't doing this. Was dead pin straight. My heart was going about 200, you know, beats a minute. And, uh, you know, just to react quickly, get out of the way, and then the car went past us. We saw something coming at us. We reacted. We moved. She had no reaction at all. She didn't stop. She didn't slow down. She didn't move. And Diane looked completely normal. People that saw her said that she looked like she was just driving casually with just like a blank face. She was just cruising down the wrong way, down the highway, going 75 to 85 miles an hour, somewhere in that range. I don't think she had any idea she was on the wrong side of the highway. So they continued on the highway for 1.7 miles before they finally got in an accident. Diane ended up colliding head on with a 2004 Chevrolet Trailblazer. The trailblazer then hit another car, a 2002 Chevy Tracker. And at the time that Diane hit them, she was going 85 miles per hour. What road are we on? What mile walk are you at? What road are we on? What road is this? What road? 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 What, 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 hold on, hold on, stop yelling. Oh, listen, uh, I'm now shooting you to the police officer. Okay, are you out at the scene right now? Yes, I'm at the scene. Okay, are there any injuries? 
No, do we have fatalities? Fatality at the scene? Yeah, we have, yeah, we have okay, fatalities. Okay, stand, stand the phone with me. I'm going to give you EMS, okay? Hold on. Fuck it. So an ambulance, too. We have a possible, uh, we have a possible car fire. Car yeah. may blow up as well. Witnesses say she was driving erratically along this road, weaving in and out of traffic and honking her horn. Tons of people got out of their car to try to help them, but it was just a horrible scene. I mean, the cars were trashed. You could just see the metal was so tangled up. And there are pictures of Diane. I'm obviously not gonna put them in this YouTube video. I really don't even recommend looking them up. I don't know why there's pictures of her released. I don't think there's pictures of the kids, but it's just brutal. She was in terrible condition. And the saddest thing about this is that the kids didn't seem to have even been wearing seatbelts. They don't even know if they were in car seats. They they may have just been like free roaming the car. Diane's daughter died immediately at the scene of the crash as well as Diane and so did two of her nieces. Her son was trapped under the bodies of the other four children and wasn't even found at first but eventually they found him and he did end up surviving. They took him to the hospital. Her other niece however was barely hanging on to life. They brought her to the hospital and she did end up passing. And then in the other car, the trailblazer, three men also died. 81 year old Michael Bestardi, his 49-year-old son Guy, and their 74-year-old friend Dan Longo. Luckily, the two people in the Chevy Tracker only had minor injuries, but it was just terrible. So like I said, Brian, her son, did survive. He had several broken bones. I mean, he was in bad condition. He had head trauma. He had to be in the hospital for several months, but he did survive. However, he now has something called ocular motor nerve palsy, which affects the movements of his right eye. Held on July 30th, such a tragic event for all of these kids to just die in a split second, and it just made no sense. Why was Diane on the wrong side of the road? What was going on? What was happening in the car? Why were the kids crying? None of this made sense, and I think that's why this made it so much harder for people, you know, attending the funeral and stuff, because it was just so tragic. So obviously people start to think, was Diane may be under the influence of something. That's obviously what you're gonna think because in most situations where someone's driving on the wrong side of the highway, they're drunk. So once investigators started looking at everything a little more and searched her car, they actually found a bottle of vodka. It was broken, but it was on the driver's side on the floor. Daniel was asked about this. Can you sling a bottle the, of vodka? Sure. Yeah, the, the state police tells um, that there was a bottle of absolute vodka in the van. Do you know where that came from? Who it was? Can you explain it? No, I know. How do you explain the vodka? We usually will keep it in our camper throughout the whole season. One bottle. Why? Why? You know, you have pina coladas. You sit by a campfire right, cooking campfire. marshmallows. What was the vodka bottle doing in a car? My wife packed all the bags that day in the camper and leaves them by the door. I carry them from the camper to the trucks. I'm very surprised that the vodka bottle was in there. I had no idea. I don't well, know why does she it give it you, Does it give you pause to think that maybe, just maybe, she was a drinker and you didn't know it? I've been with her 13 years, absolutely not. Daniel, why appear here? Why keep on doing this? The truth, mm. the truth will come out. But Larry, you have to understand, Danny doesn't want the other families to think that a drunk driver killed their families. That's why we are out to prove that she, try to prove that she wasn't drunk. He was very steadfast that she was not drunk. It was early in the morning like driving home from a camping trip. Who decides to just get trashed randomly, you know? This isn't making sense. But then the toxicology report came back. They found that she had a blood alcohol content level of 0.19%. The legal BAC limit for driving while intoxicated in New York is 0.08%. There was approximately six grams, which is about 10 drinks worth of alcohol in her stomach that had not even been absorbed into her blood yet. They were also able to see that she had high levels of THC in in her system, which doesn't necessarily mean she was high right then. It could have been something she smoked earlier the night before or something, but it definitely raised some flags. So even after these reports came out though, Daniel and a lot of people close to Diane were completely against the idea that she was intoxicated while she was driving. They said, there has to be another explanation for this. Why would she just randomly wake up and decide I'm gonna get trashed and drive all these kids in a minivan home, like from the mountains? It's just very odd. I never knew her to drink. So why would she be drinking with my kids in the car and her kids in the car? 
like didn't no, just no. I just thought it's impossible, and it, it was a mistake. Can you give a, a more detailed description of what happened before she went off on the trip yeah, home? I woke up at six o'clock, went down to my boat to clean it out, do what I got to do. Back about quarter to seven, seven o'clock, I woke her up, saying we have to start cleaning the camper so we can start getting home before traffic. We woke up, started packing the bags slowly, started waking the kids up slowly, started getting the kids dressed. We unloaded the camper, all the bags outside the camper, and I walk them to the car and we load them up. We had a cup of coffee, two cups of coffee, and then we left. Do you remember your last words? Yeah, I kissed everyone goodbye and my wife. Daniel was starting to get really upset because the media was really starting to portray Diane as maybe not such a good mom. And he didn't want people's memory of her to be tainted. And for people to think that she would selfishly get trashed like that and then drive her kids. But did she? Daniel Schuler and his attorney originally stated that there was no alcohol or drugs being consumed on the camping trip. That was the original story. But then it kind of changed and he started saying, well, you know, my wife never really drank to excess. And there was some drinking that weekend but that she had nothing to drink on the day of the actual crash. One of the campground co-owners actually talked to Diane that morning as she was about to leave. She was someone who knew Diane. They were like kind of friends with them and she said that she was completely sober that morning that there was no reason to believe that she was under the influence. So why would you all of a sudden start getting crunk when you get in the car? It doesn't make any sense. In addition to this the gas station employee and the McDonald's employee said that Diane was completely sober. That nothing was out of the ordinary about her and she was completely fine. Now she was looking for painkillers at the gas station though. She wasn't able to find the ones that she wanted but we have no idea why she would have wanted these. And was it for a possible tooth pain? Was it for a headache? The tooth pain thing is interesting because one of her best friends said that Diane was constantly like rubbing this one area on her cheek, especially the week that this happened. And Diane had also had several dentist appointments over the past couple of years and she really hated having dental work done, like was afraid of it. And she had to have this one extraction done and they actually got her dental records back and could see that she chose not to actually have the procedure done. She literally went in there and then was like, uh, fuck no, and left. So does that mean that maybe she had like a really badly infected or painful tooth going on that she was hiding to avoid having to go to the dentist because she had fear of that? As far as the autopsy goes, there was no damage to her organs. So there was no way that she was like a serious alcoholic behind everyone's backs. But the autopsy also showed that there was no abscess found in her tooth. All of Diane's family talks about how she really wasn't a heavy drinker, that she barely drank, like she could hold her liquor. It wasn't like she was an alcoholic by any means. Daniel, however, did say that she didn't do drugs or drink heavily, but she did smoke occasional weed, that it helped her with insomnia and pain, which it does. And even though the data shows that there was THC and alcohol in her system, it's really hard to believe that she just woke up and decided she was getting fucked up before this drive with all these kids. Like PTA mom of the year decides to go smoke a joint and down a bunch of vodka before going on this car ride home from a camping trip through the mountains. This is making no sense to me, but like the data shows that she was intoxicated. Daniel actually believes that Diane suffered from some bizarre medical issue, that maybe she had a stroke or like an aneurysm or something like that. However, when they did the autopsy, they did not find signs of anything wrong. So after she was already buried and everything and the autopsy was done, obviously, they decided that they actually wanted to exhume her body and see if maybe they could test her hair to see if there was any sign of previous drug use because your hair holds drugs longer than anywhere else and so that's the best place to test someone for drug use so they decided they were going to exhume her and hbo was actually going to film it and they were going to pay daniel a hundred thousand dollars to allow them to film the process and everything and this was going to go into a trust fund for their son brian and this never ended up happening for whatever reason so they never did that testing on on her hair or anything. But people have been very critical of Daniel for him being so defensive of his wife, refusing to accept that maybe she was drinking and driving, that maybe she had a secret alcohol problem. He was getting a lot of backlash from family, from the public. You know, the people that were closely affected by this accident who lost loved ones wanted closure and they felt like Daniel was kind of not allowing them to do that. So then in June of 2010, New York State Police released its final report on the 
accident. They released the same information that Diane was highly intoxicated at the time of the crash and also had traces of THC in her system. And what was interesting is the medical examiner actually determined this crash to be a homicide. They decided that Diane's driving was reckless and that the victims were killed because of that. She didn't have them in seat belt. She was driving out of control and swerving around. Then on August 18th, the DA decided that there would be no charges pressed in this case because Diane is the only one who could be held responsible and she's no longer here. The Bastardi family was really pissed about this. They felt like there was a serious lack of justice going on for their family members who died, which rightfully so. The Bastardi family actually filed a lawsuit against Daniel and Warren, who lost all three of his kids as well. And they were seeking unspecified damages for reckless conduct. Daniel ended up hiring his own independent investigator for $30,000 to look into it. And he found the same thing. Diane was highly intoxicated from alcohol and marijuana. But despite this, Diane's family was still refusing to accept these results because they didn't make any sense and they were so out of character. In July of 2007, Warren's wife actually filed a lawsuit against Daniel. She claimed that her three daughters suffered from terror, fear of impending death, extreme horror, fright, and mental anguish. Daniel ended up filing a lawsuit against the state of New York for unsafe roads. And he also sued Warren because the car that Diane was driving belonged to him. And they actually were required by the state to include Warren in the process because of insurance reasons. But still, it was very tense. Everyone was on edge, but eventually all these lawsuits got dropped. In August of 2009, New York Governor David Patterson proposed the Child Passenger Protection Act, and this made it a felony to drive while intoxicated if a passenger under the age of 16 is in the vehicle. Jackie and Warren Hance, who lost their whole family in this accident, created a foundation called the Hance Family Foundation. And the main purpose of it is to honor the lives of their three daughters by ensuring healthy, happy, and safe children through self-esteem educational programming. The foundation runs a program that is designed to educate girls and promote appreciation for their genuine qualities, self-awareness, and satisfaction of helping others. I mean, I can't imagine how their lives have been affected by this. It would be absolutely brutal to lose all three of your kids like that. Her friends convinced her to rejoin their early morning runs. And after a while, they even suggested she think about having another child to help her heal. She refused to even consider the idea, feeling she was too broken to be a mother again. And besides, technically, it wasn't possible because she had had her tubes tied. But her friends persisted and got her to a fertility specialist. So you tried? I tried. And? I got pregnant. <laughs> On October 11th, 2011, Casey Rose arrived. Jackie and Warren's new bundle of joy, Casey, is now 17 months old. A little girl teaching her parents to let go of some of their tragedy and to know that even after all that has been lost, there is still a way to go on. It just gives you a meaning again. <laughs> when you lose everything and then you get something to hold on to, there's really no, no way to be able to describe it. Yeah. She brings a heartbeat to this house again. So what actually happened to Diane? So some people who knew Diane said that she smoked a lot more weed than what was actually originally said. Some people claimed that she smoked a lot and that she smoked even during the day sometimes and that it was highly possible she smoked right before getting in the car to drive. But this is so weird to me because even if that's the case, even if she like smoked a joint or something before she got behind the wheel, normally this causes people to slow down. It's not gonna cause pain that would need her to go get Advil or something like that. And it's gonna probably make the person drive a lot slower or more cautious, definitely not aggressive and weaving through lanes. I don't know, that sounds really weird to me. Could it have been some type of bizarre tooth pain that was putting her into a state of delirium? Maybe she started drinking to help with the pain. Maybe she had that bottle of vodka and she started drinking some of it to help with the tooth pain, but who does that? While you're driving a bunch of kids, none of this makes sense. This doesn't make sense, you guys. <laughs> 
This is driving me crazy. Then there's an idea that maybe Diane is suffering from a rare condition called auto brewery syndrome. It's also known as drunkness disease or gut fermentation syndrome, but it's a real thing. This happens when bodies turn sugary or starchy foods, basically carbohydrates into alcohol. It may be caused by like too much yeast in the gut. Is it possible that Diane had a bunch of carbs at McDonald's and then it made her feel literally drunk but wouldn't this have happened to her before and it doesn't explain why she was in pain and why she couldn't see and why she was looking for pain medication so literally nothing about this case makes sense i don't understand what happened that day i don't know what was wrong with diane i don't understand how she had 10 drinks in her system why would you drink that much is there more to the story though is there a possible fight between her and daniel maybe she drank because of a bad experience that morning or the night before. Maybe she was hung over, like extremely hung over. I don't even know, but why was there a broken bottle of vodka in the car? Why are her levels coming up so high? None of this is making sense. It really does seem like she was driving while intoxicated, but this doesn't match up with her character. This is one of the weirder cases. I'm very curious to see what you guys think about this one. So definitely leave a comment and let me know your thoughts. But that's it for me today, guys. I hope you found this story interesting. I'll although it's very sad. There was a lot of lives lost on this day and I just feel so sorry for everyone that this affected because this probably changed so many lives in just a few seconds. It's unreal. But that's it for me today, guys. Stay safe out there and I will see you next time.